uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today. And just so you'll know, uh, mm -hmm. you'll see on the slide there that we're going to be mixing things up a little. Uh, Mike is not going to be hosting today. He's going to be talking. So instead, I would like to introduce you to someone who's going to be your new host for the day. And that someone is our new um, assistant uh, program ass assistant program director. See, I knew I would get it in a second, Brooks. This is Brooks Washington, so I'm going to let you wave to everybody. And I'm going to tell them, see, Brooks, I just put a spotlight on her. She should be at the top. And um, she is going, she works currently for Sea Grant. And what I'd like to say is that we are very proud at Nichols that Brooks is uh, one of our own alums and she specializes in communication and writing and she particularly shows a background both in biology and in writing. She also writes fiction, which by the way, I've heard is very, very good. Um, and I can't wait to read some of it. We'll be hearing more from Brooks as she takes over in a, in a minute and and leads us through today's program and um, very delighted to have her with us. And before I hand it over to Brooks, I wanna do a couple of short things. By the way, if anybody here doesn't know me, my name is Shauna Walton. I'm on the steering committee for the Bayou Culture Collaborative. I teach at Nichols State University. Um, our partners in this are the Louisiana Folklore Society, the Center for Bayou Studies at Nichols State University, the Center for Louisiana Studies at UL Lafayette, and the Folk Life in Louisiana program, which is part of the uh, Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism in the state of Louisiana. We have funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, and the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. So we want to thank them for being so generous and helping us produce this again. And right before we launch in, because we always have a few late people, so we do this little spotlight highlighting what some people may not know that the Bayou Culture Collaborative has actually been going on for a little while and it's mostly been present in a couple of kinds of workshops. One are passing it on workshops and one are sense of, and the other are sense of place and lost workshops. Those are run through the Louisiana Division of the Arts Folk Life Program and we want to spotlight some of the artists who presented in those. This is a way of passing down our heritage. What Jonathan talked to us way back in our first gathering about packing up our trunk of traditions. And so we want to introduce you to Quang Nguyen. Quang Nguyen is a traditional, this is not Quang Nguyen, Quang Nguyen is over here. Is my, is, we just have a side view of Quang Nguyen. And uh, he is a traditional uh, building trades artist, uh, Vietnamese building trades. The thing he teaches people how to do is how to attach those curved roofs, how to create those curved roofs that you see on traditional Vietnamese buildings, particularly religious buildings. So he actually um, worked with a series of four workshops. As you can tell, they were in Independence, Louisiana on the North Shore and just, just recently happened. They were in March and April of this year. And you can see right here that he's teaching Aww. someone how to create the curved, the curved roof. And we were so proud to sponsor these workshops. And what we want to tell you is, if you know of somebody that should be featured in a Passing It On workshop, there is funding available. And you can just contact Maida Owens and there's some contact information for you. And uh, we would love for to make sure that as many traditions, we pack up in our trunk as many traditions as we can and pass them on. Uh, Brooks. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, and before we get started, I just want to give a special thanks to Shauna and to the team and just to you wonderful people who are <laughs> virtually here. Thank you so much for showing up today and thank you guys for welcoming me welcome me into this um, beautiful cohort family. I feel very welcome and I'm very excited to talk about um, today's topic, um, traditional ecological knowledge and local culture. 
And really before we do get started, I also wanna say that um, as a science communicator, I definitely believe in helping scientists communicate their research to the community, but it's also to me important for the community to be heavily involved because they can um, highlight these points and highlight um, these problems and these issues that um, researchers need. So it's a definitely um, a collaboration between the community and between um, researchers and other people who are out there in the field. But enough of my blabbing, I'm going to get started and I'm going to give you guys a rundown of what we'll be talking about today. We're going to definitely introduce you guys or well, I don't have to introduce you. You know him, you love him and you appreciate him. He's going to be our speaker today, um, Dr. Mike Saunders. You guys know him. And um, then we're going to do a deep question in a breakout room discussion. And this is where we want you guys to kind of really take advantage of this time um, to not only get deep and philosophical about the things that we talk about or the things that we bring out to you today in this gathering, but to also network because this is one of the the most important parts of why we have the BCC. We want you guys to be able to network, collaborate, and bring that out there into the field. And then we're going to get a little positive afterwards, after we share, of course, what you guys discuss in the breakout rooms. We're going to um, go ahead uh, talk about hope for the coast, see what, what's hopeful out there. And then we're going to head over to announcements where Okay, I thought somebody was saying something. <laughs> we're gonna head over to announcements and we're gonna um, talk about the excellent person that's gonna be there next month, virtually, our next speaker, as well as you guys can mention in the chat what um, y'all special, so y'all special announcements are. Then we're gonna take a five minute break and we're gonna um, wrap around one. So for people who need to leave at that time, please go ahead. But before you leave, we are going to have our working groups report out about, I think about three to four working groups, I believe. And um, if you haven't seen the slides at the beginning, please wait until the end, more so towards the end, because you can get that contact information and see if you are interested in joining a working group. And then we're going to have a general discussion and uh, we're going to share until two. But we're going to move on. We're going to um, highlight the man with the plan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's the man of the hour, at least for the next 15, 18 minutes. We're on a time schedule, y'all. Uh, Dr. Mike Saunders. Okay. So he is, he is a cultural and environmental anthropologist, and he's currently the program director for the BCC. Um, he was born and raised in Texas Gulf Coast on Galveston Bay. I've never been. <laughs> While he has also conducted research in coastal Louisiana, his prior work was primarily in rural Maya communities in Western Guatemala. Today, he's going to talk to us about um, how it is relevant to our situation in Louisiana, and especially how it's related to local or traditional ecological knowledge um, and the role of culture in sustaining this knowledge. So without further ado, put your virtual hands together and give a warm round of applause to Dr. Mike Saunders. Hey, thank you, Brooks. Um, are y'all seeing my slides? Are we good? All right, thanks, Brooke. Uh, uh, whoops, as Brooks noted, uh, uh, my work's primarily been in Guatemala, and uh, and on the left you see a, a photo that I took. Uh, that's Lake Atitlan, which is a caldera lake, and the scale's kind of hard to to grasp there. That's about ten miles across that lake, and those are thirteen thousand foot volcanoes. Uh, you know, but what I want to point out, I'm at about eight thousand feet at this picture, and surrounded by tropical montane cloud for uh, forest. And uh, so, what you know, what similarities are there between that ecosystem and you know the 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 picture on the right just represents our our coastal uh coastal environment so what what why how how can we compare these things well number one they're both very specialized ecosystems um and you know in in because of that require very specialized knowledge from those uh, of those who who subsist on that ecosystem and and who work to sustain that ecosystem now this is deep knowledge. Um, are y'all seeing the gallery on mine? Uh, 
you know, where, where does this arise from? Well, one of the main reasons is because, you know, both there in the mountains of Guatemala and, and here in coastal Louisiana, many people are almost exclusively, you know, either subsisting or making their living off of, off of, off of the products from those landscapes. So that, that necessitates an ecological knowledge, a, a pretty sophisticated knowledge of your environment. Um, you know, as well, uh, this subsistence off the landscape often necessitates, you know, living in the midst of those resources you're utilizing. On the left, you see a picture of Maya homes in the midst of, of cornfields. Uh, on the right, a photo of some homes in the, uh, in the, in the marsh or bio and bayou environment. Um, you know, and, and in my mind, I mean, the, what this kind of represents is that you are using ecological knowledge when you step out your front door. Um, or you are, you know, you're, you're taking that in, you're gathering that. As well, you know, what I want to point out is that these environments require some, some relatively specialized adaptations. Um, on the right, you'll see what I refer to as a John boat, which is generic for any, any flat bottom boat where I come from, with a pirogue on it. Obviously, you know, very specialized to the landscape, very necessary to gaining subsistence off the landscape. On the, left, on the left, you see an adaptation in the area I work, uh, these terraces, which are not only adapted to the topography, but very efficient use of their water sources, uh, water resources. And, and I could go into this forever, but you know, just to, that they essentially soak every, saturate every terrace. Every, every, every. And, and as a, you know, and work that down the line by damming these furrows, saturating the terrace and then moving it down. So again, just examples of specialized adaptations to these landscapes. Now, I want to take a moment here, and this, this does take a second, but what am I talking about when I'm talking about this specialized knowledge or traditional or local ecological knowledge? This is just one good example from the area where I work. On the left, you see a picture of a, of a field being, core, uh, being cleared for, for corn. You'll notice these alders that are left in the, in the midst of the field. And those are left there both as rootstock. What they'll do is they'll use this field for about 10 years for corn. Then they'll let it regenerate naturally back to these to, to an alder thicket, and which it does very rapidly. And then they'll harvest that about 10 years later for fuel wood. In the corner, upper right corner, you actually see a, an example of how quick this stuff grows. Those were corn fields on either side of that, that road about five years before I took this picture. Now, you know, I don't know a person there who doesn't use fuel wood primarily for, for heating and, and cooking. So these alders are not only the primary source of fuel wood and, and necessary to survival, but here's where the knowledge really comes in. They're also a nitrogen fixing species and, and corn is very nitrogen dependent. Um, now, of course, when I talk to people, they don't say, oh, we leave the alders there because they, they capture nitrogen from the atmosphere and return it to the soil. But they do say, if I don't have these trees in my cornfield, the soil becomes, as they say, quemado or, or burned. So, you know, there's an example of that vernacular science and, and, and how it applies to, to what me, we might refer to as Western science. I don't like that term. But um, now in the corner, you'll see in the bottom corner, you'll see an example one of how quickly uh, a pine grows. Tree rings on that stump indicate it's about 25 years old. And that's my boot there for scale. But here's what I want to really talk about. These forests are managed as a commons. Even on your own private property, in order to cut a pine tree, you have to go to the municipality and you have to get permission to do that. Once upon a time, you approached a council of elders who, who had a, a detailed knowledge of the, of the forest and forest dynamics. And they would say, no, you need to wait a year or two more, or yes, you can depending on the forest cover surrounding them. Now, interestingly as well, if you cut that, that pine on your private land and you get permission to do that, you know, again, like anathema to our ideas of private property rights, you're also required to re replant 10 pine seed uh, saplings, uh, as you see the, the picture of. Um, these pines are not managed for, for their timber products. They are managed for the ecosystem uh, services they provide, particular aquifer recharge. And here's a good example of that and an example of how this knowledge is embedded in culture. On the left, you see a picture of Chichimuch, uh, a, a mountain that's considered the most sacred location in the region, also the highest point in the region. 
and it's referred to even by those who have converted away from indigenous Maya spirituality. It's referred to as the Tanque de Dios, the tank of God. It's considered to be hollow, filled with water. There are about a dozen springs that emerge from the bottom of that. And aside from rainwater, they provide the water almost completely for about 10 to 12,000 people. So, uh, you know, one thing that I want to talk about here is that for generations, there was a sacred or spiritual sanctions against cutting pine trees on this mountain. And I heard stories of people who were struck instantly paralyzed, who died in their sleep, who became raging alcoholics and died in the street because they had cut a pine tree. These days, this land, which was once communal on this mountain, has been divided into private parcels as well. There's been a huge conversion away from indigenous spirituality. And yet the, the, the idea of the pine trees on this mountain being crucial to local, local survival remains. Why pine trees? Because this is the highest uh, point on, this, on, the, on the rim, but also it's about 50 miles as the crow flies from the Pacific Ocean. So these moisture laden Pacific air currents come in hit that mountain. And here's an example. The picture on the left is sunrise. At sunrise, the picture in the right corner is about five hours later. These clouds are condensing even during the dry season. The peak of that mountain in the afternoons is covered, is surrounded by these clouds. And pines act as a particularly efficient, almost a strainer. And they collect that incipient atmospheric moisture, continual fog drip into the ground and aquifer recharge. As my friends say, it rains below the trees, even when it's not raining above them. All right, I have not done the extensive field work I would be, I hope to do and would love to do, but I have to say, I think it's pretty certain that similar specialized knowledge is necessary in, in, in estuary, coastal plain, marsh, swamp environments, whether that be a vegetation and what that might indicate, hydrology, land building processes, and, and so I see this same knowledge and I see it as embedded in culture, which I'll talk about in a second here as well. All right, if I'm saying that, well, if it is indicated to me that, that important ecological knowledge is embedded in culture, you know, can this hand, stand the disruption that, that both Highlands Guatemala and, and coastal Louisiana or Louisiana in general are, are experiencing right now? Both environmental, this is an example, on the left is a mudslide near where I work. On the right is a picture from Ida. And just like hurricanes, mudslides and other environmental uh, impacts are being felt much more frequently and much more severe there. But the main disruption I really want to talk about here. On the right, you see a picture, and these are taken from the same location. You see a picture of the, the, the landscape in, in Chakea, where I work in 1993 or 94 when I was first there. On the left, a much more recent picture. In the early 90s, this community was still almost wholly a, a, subsistence, a subsistence agricultural community. Very little contact with the quote unquote outside world, very little integration into a market economy. Yet 30 years later, you'll see those terraces. They get four crops of onions and carrots a year out of those. This road, which was once a, a, basically a dirt track, is now well paved. You have box trucks rolling up there four times a year, loading onions, loading carrots, taking them straight to Guatemala City, putting them on planes, and we buy them a couple of days later in Walmart. So this massive socioeconomic change, which even as a younger and more naive anthropologist, I saw as the death knell of Maya culture, and especially the ecological knowledge. Yet, despite these changes, uh, and I'll talk about this in real briefly in just a second, culture and the knowledge in it have endured. Now, of course, coastal Louisiana, Louisiana in general, experienced over the last century the same massive socioeconomic change. Uh, you'll see a picture of Mr. Charlie, the first transportable and, and self-contained rig. On the left, some pictures that kind of represent this change from what might have been more of a subsistence context to commercial fisheries and even automation within, within that industry. All right, through these disruptions, you know what, 
and if if ecological knowledge is so linked to culture, here are some things that I've seen in in Guatemala and 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 how I think this is crucial to recognize here. For the Maya, there are four things that they truly say makes a, a person Maya. One is these heritage handicrafts right here. A lady's on a backstrap loom, and, and even her, her her indigenous clothing outfit that that we peel that blouse that she's wearing that represents. This is a lakeside uh, lakeshore community that represents the lake. Her neck hole is the fountain of creation. There are abstract trees, humans on that so. The clothing is linked to the landscape. But more than that, even though most of the females now work in the tourist industry, big down on the lake, and they can say work for one month and buy a wee peel instead of working for four months to make one, it's still considered necessary to know how to use a, a backstrap loom to be a proper Maya woman. That and make tortillas. They say if you make tortillas and use a backstrap loom, you're a, you're a good candidate for marriage. Uh, on the right, you see uh, Janie Luster carrying on similar uh, uh, traditions. Food waste, tortillas, not only the, the, the food that they say, you're not Maya if you don't eat tortillas. And I think many people might say, you're not Cajun if you don't eat crawfish. But this communal sharing of food is important. And, and it not only reiterates this link to the landscape, but to the culture. Um, and so people say, you know, our textiles, our, our foods and our language are critical. You see, this is the, the government offices in, a, in Solala, which is a nearby market town to, to where I work. And they're written in both Spanish and Kachiko. And people identify and say, I'm not Kachiko if I don't speak Kachiko. Even my friends who have spent 10, 15 years in the United States. Uh, on the left, you see a, a picture of the, the bilingual signage in, in Louisiana. And hopefully we're working towards some indigenous signage one day. And what's the fourth thing people say? Well, they say our link to the landscape is what makes us Maya. Being a part of this landscape makes us Maya. And as I see it, you know, I kind of flip the script. You don't have sustainability arising from culture or social actions. You have culture arising from sustainability. If, if you can live on that landscape and subsist there and gain a sense of place, that's where that culture develops. Um, as another team member was talking about, you know, the Acadians wouldn't have become the Cajuns should they have not moved to this landscape, subsisted on this landscape. So you know, I don't know where I stand with time, but I'm going to make a couple of uh, concluding points here. What can we do? Well, I've been collecting this, this TEK, this ecological knowledge in the, in, in the Maya Highlands for about 10 years now. Uh, because rich soils, extremely productive soils, healthy forests, pure water, I have no doubt that at some point outsiders, whether with financial resources or say the federal government exerting some centralized control, there are gonna be people moving into this area. And if they approach this with what are more mainstream, you know, management techniques, looking at discrete resource units, not approaching it you know with a holistic ecosystem approach which is gaining traction in, in western management paradigms uh, the whole thing would fall apart you know as, as i see it and moreover what i really want people to see this knowledge as sure it's qua qualitative to some degree but i see it as this data set on a temporal scale that we can't replicate in the laboratory we can't replicate in field experiments this is essentially ecological, traditional ecological knowledge are essentially the results of a centuries or generations long grand experiment. And we need to recognize that as the data set that it is, package that a bit in a way, and, and that way present it to planners and policymakers and let them understand more, this is irreplaceable knowledge and invaluable. Um, what else can we do? Ecological knowledge is in culture. Public art, art, the, as we here at the BCC are promoting, is crucial to sustaining that knowledge, uh, especially public art. Here, you know, I'll just go through this real quickly, but uh, this mural on the right, murals have appeared everywhere now. This one is, is, is in your face reiterating Maya identity. There's a lady making corn, uh, grinding corn on a matate, traditional corn uh, stone. 
Uh, there's some kids listening to their elders. There's a lady on a backstrap loom. So, you know, supporting culture sustains ecological knowledge, ties people to the land. So, you know, it's a call for action for me to gather this ecological knowledge, to compile what we have, to look in the little museums, Galliano, Golden Meadow, uh, Thibodeau, look at what artifacts, what knowledge we have there. If something has been documented in a research paper or a newspaper article, it doesn't matter. We need to put this stuff together, get what we can, and, and you know, make it clear to people how valuable it is, or at least I hope to. Um, you know, as well, I see supporting, you know, these festivals are tied to the land, whether the Rougarou Fest or a powwow or this festival in, in Guatemala. This slide is both a memorial and, you know, a real exclamation point to what I'm saying here. Um, on, on the right, you see me as a young 21-year-old man and, and my friend Don Fidel Acalon as a 27-year-old just starting a life of service to the sacred community, to his community. Um, on the left, you see him with my son several years ago. Um, he died a few months ago, and not only did I lose a friend of 30 years and possibly the most trusted friend I've ever had, but irreplaceable knowledge. 10 years of working closely with him, and I barely scratched the surface. And I feel like that is happening around us here as we speak. As older generations pass on, that knowledge is gone and cannot be replaced. And so thank you all for listening. I hope I made a, a couple of interesting or points in at least you know mildly interesting way. And I, I really appreciate my team for giving me the opportunity to do this and you all for being here and participating in this. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike. I mean, that was awesome. That was awesome, y'all. I hope y'all giving him a virtual round of applause <laughs> again. That was that was good. And now we're just gonna go ahead and maybe open up the virtual floor, see if you guys have any questions, maybe in the chat, or you can raise your hand. At the, <laughs> if you look down at the um uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you hit reactions and then you'll see raise your hand feature so you can raise your hand virtually if you want to ask Mike any questions before we do our breakout rooms. Okay, we're, we're asking questions. So if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand like this. You hit the little raise a hand button pushes you to the top. Seeing any hands going up. I'm going to ask a question to Mike. So Mike, um, about your, your talk. Um, what I find sometimes in um, preserving TEK is it almost seems like if the government tries to do it uh, formally, they don't do as good a job as informal family to family preservation, which is kind of like it kind of it's a paradox, like the most isolated places that did not have government help, they preserve Cajun music better than the big city places. And, you, you know, I found in my research, should I not have been so deeply integrated? I mean, I, I consider those folks, some of them, their family. I've known them for 30 years. Had I not been sitting at dinner tables, uh, playing soccer with the kids, all of those things, a lot of this I, I would not have known for one thing, but I would not have internalized. I would not have seen the life cycles of both, you know, the, the, the non-human nature and as well how that blended with the life cycles of the people. And so to, to kind of speak to your point, you know, I definitely experienced that not only in the way that I was able to gather data, but in the way that that was preserved in that community as compared to, you know, uh, if, an, if another government researcher would have come in and questioned these people, they would have answered just the same way they answered me the first couple of years. Oh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, you know, there's nothing important to know here. The trees grow. And it wasn't until 10 years of, of be, becoming part of the family that I was able to, to really get to the, the bottom of a lot of this. So thanks, Gary. Gave me, a, gave me an opportunity to say something else. 
The deep question is how is local culture linked to traditional ecological knowledge? And so basically we want you guys to think about this. We're gonna give you guys about 15 minutes to, and I'm gonna put you guys in a group. And we just want you guys to not only talk about this, but feel free to introduce yourselves. If you're shy, you can go ahead and and do a nice little direct message in chat, doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as you guys are collaborating and you know you are um, networking. Who, who is gonna report out to us? Uh, Maida, I don't know if you were back, but one of the, the uh, is it you, Simone? Yes. Uh, Simone's gotta go, so she's gonna report out about her group real or now. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, I'm reporting out for the culture and planning working group and we met last week and we're going to have a meeting next week, uh, Friday at one o'clock. So Theo Hilton is our point person. Um, and if you want to be included in that group, you can reach out to Theo. Um, some of the things that we're talking about, and his, he just put his email in the chat, um, thank you. So <clears throat> some of the things that we're talking about doing, um, well, first, we want to create a list of sort of principles or pillars um, for how we think about culture and planning, um, particularly as it relates to um, social justice and thinking about relocation, traditional ecological knowledge, all these different things that we think need to be elevated um, within coastal planning. And so we have a Jamboard set up so you can contribute ideas to the Jamboard, um, which Theo just also put a link in the chat to. I'm also compiling a list of recommendations um, that others have made about coastal planning and how to integrate culture um, and social dimensions, resilience, um, social justice things into coastal planning. And so um, you can also reach out to me if you have any suggestions to make. Um, I'll also put my email in the chat. Um, and I think that is about it for our group. Um, again, we're meeting next Friday at one o'clock. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Sorry thanks, to, thanks, to, 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 to re, you know, do the schedule. Sorry. No, that's that's fine. And I, I know that in attending y'all's group, there's some pretty exciting things going on. So if anybody is interested, we'll also repeat the contact info here in the, uh, toward the end of the meeting. Thanks again, Simone. Thanks, Simone. Um, so yes, I, I guess uh, we're gonna get back to the, the discussion. Um, I see somebody, Anne, you shared uh, in the chat about, um, I don't wanna butcher the French, so I'm gonna let you say it <laughs> if you want to. Okay. Right, okay. Well, actually uh, our discussion included how the loss of language and loss of many things is connected to the loss of environmental cultural things. We ended up talking about handmade fishing and crawfish uh, nets and traps. And that brought our question to, well, what did you call that? And knowing that sometimes when the craft disappears, the words that describe the craft and the task also are gone as well as the um, as well as the activity itself. And so I was uh, googling and actually helping jog my really funky um, French. And that's what you call it. The verb is uh, filet artisanal, meaning a handcrafted net. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was thinking it, but I didn't want to say it just in case. <laughs> I'm not. I'm definitely. I'm learning, y'all. I'm learning. Well, I well, I don't want to butcher anybody's language. Brooks, look at this. I just barely restrained myself from actually copying the Wikipedia pronunciation <laughs> with the little thing on it because their pronunciation was not Cajun. Mm -hmm. It was very strictly. Um, continental French. And um, so that is always a challenge as our dialects develop in, in context. 
Yeah, well, you know, um, well, thank you for that. And I mean, look, you're gonna make me feel very comfortable now. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm gonna be French speaker 100%, but we're, we're getting there, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep y'all posted every, every gathering. <laughs> and, uh, um, but any, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Brittany, okay. Brittany was in my group. Yeah, so I volunteered to, um, to share what our group talked about and I have to run. So I wanna make sure I got in here. Um, we talked a lot about kind of how essential traditional ecological knowledge is and having a holistic understanding of a place and change over time. And so, and then our conversation kind of developed into thinking about those tensions between when someone's a specialist in different like scientific realms, whether it's, you know, the specialist in botany or the specialist in anthropology and how, if there's not cross pollination between these different aspects of ecological knowledge, then it's less rich, the holistic understanding, right? And how essential it is to have that cross pollination. Excellent you, point. <laughs> <laughs> you did that so fast. Was, um, and I see, I don't, um, Honora, I, I don't, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, I see that you said in the chat, erasing language has been one of the ways to deliberately kill culture in many places. And yeah, it's very, very true. And then um, Dustin, um, he mentioned that I came across that term when I was asking people to tell me way for late I'm sorry <clears throat> stories <laughs> and some elders thought I was asking about repairing shrimp nets very confusing conversations so yeah language is very important very very important um both in culture and in, on um and in research as well uh anything else anything else that anybody um hasn't shared from uh, the breakout groups before we um Switch over to Hope for the Coast. Oh, yeah. Let's see. <coughs> so, um, I guess we're just going to go ahead and um, thank you guys once again uh, for sharing your thoughts. Um, it, it is approaching one o'clock, so we know that some of you guys may have to sign off, but we want to end on a positive note at least and see, you know, Mike, what is your hope for the coals? What what do you feel? Well, you know, over the last few days, I kept thinking about what I was going to say for this. And, and in the meantime, I was communicating with all these group conveners and, and attending working group meetings and looking at the documents y'all were posting. And I realized that's my hope for the ghost. We are what we are doing. And this this network and these working groups and how much participation there is, what a diverse constituency we've got. I mean, I think what we're sitting in the middle of is is a, is is my hope. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, and if you guys want to take a few moments before we before we head to break, or if you have to leave, please um, share in the chat um, your hope for the coast. And um, I believe we're going to take our five minute break and then, um, oh yeah, announcements first. Would you guys like to do announcements first or uh, the break? Well, we can announce uh, next month. Okay. Scott Hemmerling will be joining us. Uh, and uh, he, he and I have communicated a little bit and I think he's going to follow up kind of real nicely on what I was trying to get across and look at some kind of tangible ways to actually engage communities, especially through TEK or, or other means in, in planning. So hopefully y'all join us for that. And feel free to leave any announcements that you guys have in the chat as well. I guess we do wanna remind people that if you ever want to connect with us, this is how you do it. And, um, and, and Gary LaFleur is- I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, Shauna. Uh, <clears throat> no, no. Made it just posted in the chat um, all the contact information if you guys want to join the working groups that we have. And, you know, like we said, like this is one of the major points of BCC to collaborate and introduce yourself and see Dr. LaFleur has his, his hands up. <laughs> well, since we're talking about folklore, uh, it, it sounded like we, we had a little uh, quiet, quiet spot. 
So I got some news from the estuary. Some news from the estuary is that uh, the Mississippi kites have shown up about <laughs> six days ago. All of a sudden, people are saying, man, I saw my first Mississippi kite of the year. What's weird is this is a bird that uh, used to not be here, you know. About 15 years ago, all of a sudden, they started showing up. So the Mississippi kites are back. And uh, you might have picked your first dewberries already. Usually, Christy uh, is uh, before me, but uh, the dewberries are out, too. We haven't had enough water, enough rain for the dewberries to be happy. But if you can find some that are in the shade, maybe by a mulberry tree, you can get mulberries and dewberries. And that's about it for me. That's but a big announcement. Um, the dewberries. Announcements. Um, for those who didn't hear me when we first started, the City Nature Challenge uh, competition is going on this weekend. Uh, and there's communities all over the state that are participating. You go to, you just Google City Nature Challenge or go to iNaturalist and you go around and document every living organism you can find over this uh, three or four day weekend period and upload it to the iNaturalist app. And uh, it's good citizen science. It's, uh, and I think that might even be something we could do for our traditional ecological knowledge even. We could, we could just, yeah. start a group uh, to start documenting what are these things that we can associate certain knowledge with you can start a group for any number of things on the iNaturalist. So, you, you know, this is oh, just yeah. one, one thing that they're doing, the City Nature Challenge. It's, uh... Well, I mean, that's obviously an integral part of, of ecological knowledge. Um, and when you denounced that beforehand, that's what I was thinking is, oh, well, that ties right into what I want to say. I think uh, for anybody who is interested in, um, in these working groups, and I have attended a number of them, and they're pretty exciting. Um, you know, a lot of great dialogue. Um, people are coming up with some real tangible action steps and, and policy recommendations already. And uh, um, I guess we should announce uh, that we will be meeting with the governor's office on the 16th. And uh, we, as a, a, the, the BCC team, We'll have a, a lot more of a, an idea about you know what what kind of relationship the governor's office wants with our with our group, and I, I think we really hope to get across to them just what a what a diverse group this is, what a what a wide contingency uh, 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 constituency uh, we have, and and the, the the participation and the work that's happening as we speak. So as far as it, um, just to clarify, like the dates of meeting with the governor's office, you said the 16th. I believe so. And that's just uh, our management team. OK, so the um, based on the email that we received, I had in the document that I created for our working group, I, I had but I think I had a date sometime in August whenever we were actually going to have a meeting to present our policy proposals. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, this is just an initial meeting to really see Got it. what what we can do for them or what they can do for us, to put it as simplistically, I guess. But uh, yeah, that was Rachel, the Rachel, if you want to send some brainstorming ideas for... Yeah. If, if, if you have a list of things that... Um, you're kind of brainstorming about maybe just that maybe should be on our minds when we when we meet. They We'd have be a, happy to uh, consider your Carmen list. They have a great document put together with a few things, Gary. And and yeah, to any of the other conveners that are listening or group members, um, you know, if you can get those ideas to us, then we we will have a better foundation for our own discussion with with the off with governor's office. And what, so we welcome that. And again, y'all, y'all are doing great work, Rachel. It's you know, I I saw some very tangible things to discuss in in your preliminary document. Thanks. I'm trying to recruit more people to join our working group, <laughs> so who are um, who would have even more ideas. So. All right. Um, on that note.
Oh, Rachel. Uh, no, Simone. Simone took care of that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, uh, so Christy, Rachel, and Kezia, if y'all would like to uh, tell us a little bit about what your groups are doing. Let's say... Yes, hello. Um, Kezia with the Artists, Tradition Bearers, and Coastal Issues. Um, yeah, we talked about uh, maybe figuring out a way to do like a traveling exhibit and um, I don't get a way to create, have a way for local artists to be able to showcase their work throughout the state, uh, whether that be uh, partnering with the local body councils. Uh, Dix also talked about uh, applying for a small grant um, that can represent like a fishing net throughout the state. I might be butchering all of this. So if you want to interject, be awesome. Um, we're going to have, I think, meetings every three weeks uh, at on Wednesday at 6 p.m. You can email me here at kezia at wwno.org. Um, and that, that's all I have. No, thanks, Kezia. That was that was an interesting meeting. Uh, Maida and I were both part of the other day, and and uh, I believe Dix was here for a bit. I'm not sure if she still is, but uh, she had really talked about the role of of art therapy and and in 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 and its impact on health and and well being. Oh, there's Dix right there. Um, Hello. I just kind of. Just threw out art therapy, and if Jonathan's around, uh, you know he had come up with this culture therapy uh, mm -hmm. uh, idea. Uh, yeah, Maida said I should meet him. Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a piece where we would travel to the communities um, and using a, a fishing net, shrimp net, as like a the armature, and weave in and out different textile pieces, um, and. I would facilitate making sure it was a safe environment, um, you know, for if any kind of difficult emotions arise or whatever. But um, I'm a trauma sensitive art therapist. So my, I'm a trauma specialist. So there's a lot of teaching I can do and learning how to regulate through the art making process that, you know, we all do uh, Culturally, you know, we all have different art forms, whether it be music or dance or, or visual art. So um, just kind of connecting those pieces and the grant, um, it would allocate like each community, like whatever tradition bearer would, would participate, they would be paid hourly. And I'm going to keep looking for bigger ones. Um, I This I wrote really quick because I saw it and it was due like in three days. So I just kind of smushed it together, but it kind of gave me like a a skeleton of what to build on to make it bigger. And I, I imagine going, I mean, like incorporating Isleños, Vietnamese, the Croat community, indigenous all along the coast to, to Lake Charles. Um, and because there's something very liberating when you put it in this visual image, especially when we feel, many of us feel invisible and after disasters, you know. Um, waiting for your, your insurance and FEMA to get you a, a roof, so to speak. So um, th there's that component to it, um, a healing process and a creative process. It's pretty, pretty incredible, so. Um, thanks, Dix. And Maida? Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to point out that the Louisiana Division of the Arts has uh, the Louisiana uh, project grants that are done through the regional arts councils. And uh, uh, so anyone that has a project uh, that's related to the arts um, and culture, uh, you know, and folk, folk life is considered uh, one of the uh, art forms. Um, you know, the, the next deadline is gonna be July 1st. This is an annual deadline, so it would, um, you know, in arts grants, you have to plan pretty far in advance. So if anybody uh, wants to consider this, I'd be happy to talk with you about possible projects and then refer you on to 
the you know how you would actually uh, apply because these are done through the regional arts councils. It is a statewide project. You know, it, it is available statewide though. Um, Dix, you're getting some kudos on your idea. Um, let's see, Christy or uh, Rachel, if either y'all would like to mention a little bit about your group. And thanks, Dix and Kezia. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so I uh, joined this working group kind of recently, right after the Folklore Society meeting. Um, David Sheremy is the convener, but he is very busy right now. So I am the convener, sort of, <laughs> right now, pretty much right now. Um, and I put together this document. So what David told me about the participants in the working group is that they had four main interest areas for French uh, in Louisiana, which all of which were very broad. Um, uh, and so I put together a document outlining um, what these interest areas are and the potential for the governor's office to uh, be involved uh, in these areas. So uh, one is French signage, um, two is French education outreach for adults. So outside of traditional centers of learning, universities, um, or even like the Alliance Française, I guess. Um, three is language documentation projects, and four is French immersion curriculum support. Um, so what I have found is that really two of these issues are probably going to be areas where the governor's office, just because of the scope of what they actually can do, are going to be able to assist us with. And so what we need to, uh, the, the steps that we need to be looking at right now is really funding. Um, and uh, just getting more collaboration um, on working towards these. So um, French education outreach for adults, I put as being a low priority. Um, I don't think that there's really much that the governor's office can do um, to help us with that. And then language documentation projects is another low priority one. These are areas that the Bayou Culture Collaborative that, that we as a group, um, just as a working group could address. Um, but in terms of this immediate um, objective, which is to have support from the governor's office, we uh, should focus more on French signage and French immersion curriculum support. Um, the idea that I have for now is that in order to garner more support for meeting both of these needs, um, we should create a centralized resource to facilitate funding for translation. So if you want French, more French signage in your municipality, um, that comes down to needing someone to translate signs. Um, French immersion curriculum support is a very, that, that's a vast area that um, is a years long project. Um, to, to improve French immersion curriculum, but one consistent need in every parish, particularly for emerging immersion programs is the translation of curriculum. Um, I've worked in French immersion education before. I have lots of colleagues that are teachers as well as administrators. And they um, there are many, many issues. They need lots and lots of support across the board, but ultimately what they need is uh, access to translated curriculum because a lot of times districts roll out new curriculum um, and it needs to be translated as they go. So French immersion teacher, all teachers are overworked and overburdened. French immersion is particularly vulnerable. Um, so my proposition uh, for now is, let me see if I can read off the page because it's gonna be much more succinct. So through, connections that we have with CODAFIL and the Lieutenant Governor's Office, um, we need to facilitate funding for creating a program that would alleviate the, the consistent challenge, which is the need for translation all the time. Um, that's not where it is, hang on y'all. So 
I want to create, or I, I propose that we create a centralized network of translation contractors in Louisiana who could offer services to governments, organizations, or even private individuals. So this would solve um, a couple of issues, which is that a lot of French speakers in Louisiana need jobs. Um, and this is a pretty high demand within Louisiana. So we can collaborate with CODAFIL. I have contacts with CODAFIL. They're under the Lieutenant Governor's office. Um, there are lots of ideas. I've been in contact with um, several uh, professionals, professors um, in my region who could help me with this, who have already given me some leads on grants that we could apply for for this. Um, so we're still in the talking stage, but by the time we get to August, we will have some concrete steps and a plan in order to put this into effect. Um, but if y'all want to uh, contribute to this, if you have ideas about it, or you just wanna read my document, which is actually really succinct in spite of my rambling presentation, but your email, you can send me your email address. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. One of these days I'll get used to muting and unmuting. Um, I really appreciate that. And again, everybody, if y'all wanna take a look at some of these documents people are producing, I, I think you'd be not only impressed, but maybe maybe far more interested in joining in. Um, Christy, are you? Uh... I'm here. Oh. <laughs> hey, everybody. So um, the Ecology and Culture Working Group, um, we met last uh, Friday, last Thursday or Friday. I can't remember what day of the week it was now. Um, and we started to put together a list of action items that we were considering. And while we were going through that, we kind of came to a point where we were trying to figure out if we were overlapping too much with other groups. And so we decided to back off of that a little bit and we put up a jam board um, similar to what the um, cultural and coastal planning group had put together. So the idea is that we can identify areas for some cross collaboration between the groups um, without uh, duplicating effort too much. Um, so um, I had posted earlier in the um, chat our Jamboard um, link. Link, thank you. <laughs> our Jamboard link and our um, link to our notes, and um, also a recording of the meeting in case you wanted to catch up with that information. So you can access both that Google document, which has the notes list on it, and the um, the uh, Jamboard if you want to add to that um, after going through what you've kind of seen in our in our notes document there as well. Um, we're also looking at trying to plan a another meeting coming up soon, and based on our um, responses to our poll, which um, I think we have close to 15 or 20 people in that group, but only 18 responded, or only eight responded so far. Um, it looks like maybe the uh, 19th or 20th of May, so in a couple weeks. And um, we'll let you guys know more definitively as that filters out more. Thanks, Christy. And again, I've, I've attended that that meeting. It's fantastic. And, you know, we're all coming up or each of the groups kind of coming up with their own ideas. And because I sit in on a number of them, I do see that overlap. But right now, kind of incubating the ideas in these individual working groups, I think soon enough, we're going to be able to really start looking at how they they, they overlap and, and, you know, how we can combine efforts. I think it's that cross pollination is is critical, I think, or can be critical um, real quick. Maida, did you want to mention to any of the conveners here about the big folder, uh, the BCC big folder, or have we figured out how? Uh, I, well, I can just mention that one need we've identified is uh, a better way for all the working groups to communicate and have the notes uh, accessible to anybody who wants to use them. There is what we call a big folder in our Google uh, Drive. And uh, we're going to be sending everybody more information about uh, how to access that. Uh, for example, uh, the jam boards should be available to everybody. Um, and, you know, as is the, the everybody's notes. Um, so yeah, we, we've realized that uh, we need to facilitate your communication and we're working on a plan. Thanks, Maida. You, 
you you just explained it better than I than than I would have. Um, okay, well that's our uh, that's our working group conveners, and thanks, y'all. I, I so much appreciate not only your time and effort here, but in in organizing these things, and in, in you know pushing them forward, and and the progress that people are making. Um, I mean, y'all are making this a success. Y'all are my hope for the coast. <laughs>